Diabetes Live. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, joined as always by Steve Edelman. And so why are we wearing these things today? Well, a couple reasons. So today's talk is on exercise and diabetes, particularly with a, a slant on diabetes technology, CGM, pump, how to prepare for exercise, all those kinds of things. Also wearing these because it says TCOID on them. And also because, Steve, you wanted to tell the story yeah. of these. Uh, uh, many years ago, when we, even before we updated our logo, Jeremy surprised me uh, as a birthday gift. And we were at the American Association of Diabetes Educators, as they were called back then, uh, and got four or five shirts. We gave one to myself, himself, Bill Polonsky, Juan Frias, Ian Bloomer, and we wore these on our <laughs> bike rides. And you know what? I still am impressed on the quality of the company. I always told you that. Yeah. It's got little zippers for keys. It's a stretchy, and it also unzips all the way down. Whoops. <laughs> I got the mic hooked on here. And uh, so it's there are good bike shirts, and then there are awesome bike shirts. So thank you, buddy. Yeah, no problem. All right. So exercise. It can be really difficult. You know, we always talk about it's so important to do it you know, just for your overall health, maintaining your sanity, those kinds of things. But man, it can be a bear on your blood sugars. Um, so the thing that we're gonna talk about, really when it comes to exercise, there's two main problems that we're trying to address. One is low blood sugars during exercise. And the other is the kind of the post-exercise uh, spike or high blood sugars after. So going low during, high after. And what are tips and tricks to avoid those things? Yeah, I'll just say up front that if you have type 2, uh, you're not on insulin, you know, it's pretty easy. You can get out there and do your thing. But for us type 1, it's probably one of the most frustrating things. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to exercise, but we either end up low during which is the biggest aggravating thing ever. Mm -hmm. You gotta consume calories, you have to stop your exercise. And there, then- There really is nothing worse than that. Yeah. You know, having to drink a soda or something when you're exercising, like you're there to try to lose weight, get in shape, and then like you have to stop what you're doing and you have to like eat or drink, it drives me insane. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is if you uh, do everything right, and we're gonna talk about reducing the insulin on board, and if you don't end your exercise correctly, a lot of people shoot up. Mm -hmm. They always say, why do I shoot up after exercise? So it's complicated if you're a type one, because we have people on multiple daily injections. We got people, what we call on dumb pumps. Uh, these are people wearing pumps and CGM that aren't communicating. And then we got people on automatic insulin delivery, hybrid closed loop systems. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's an art actually. And before I forget, if you really like seeing us in these outfits, we actually did an exercise challenge where we wore these. We went to Steve's house, actually. I did a, a spin cycle, a Peloton, for 45 minutes, and Steve walked on a treadmill for 45 minutes. You can uh, find it on our website, tcoid.org, or just Google TCOID Exercise Challenge, where we talk about all these things. And guess what? We, we spent a yeah. lot of time preparing on what we should say and how we educate people. And when we did the exercise and we filmed it and sped it up, it didn't go so great. Um, I started really high, um, like at 240. You know, I was aiming to start a little bit higher and, and walk it and write it down. Um, but not higher than to, 240, though. Not that high. Just I wanted to be like clear. 180 yeah. or so, and I yeah. way overshot, and it started at 240, so I wasn't happy with that. Um, and then you kind of had the opposite happen. Oh, I started low, and then I ate. Uh, we had ordered these Ikes, not Mikes, but Ikes, patent right infringement, these huge subs. Each sub was over 1,000 calories. So mm -hmm. I... I decided to eat half, and then I ate the other half, and I ended up super high. But of all the comments we got, people love the fact that we screwed up. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are normal, like all of you are normal. All right, so what to do about it? Well, I just made up last night these three P's of exercise. So one, preparation, what to do before you exercise. Two, participation, kind of during exercise. And three, your post-exercise recovery. So those three P's. The three P's, I love that. Yeah. So, um, thank you. I'm glad you read my email. Um, so this is what I'm we're glad you do. read the seven page of notes I wrote for this thing. Um, so starting with preparation. So we're going to get into insulin adjustments and things like that. But first, I think one of the most important things that, that usually goes kind of untalked about is actually the time of day that you exercise. Mm -hmm. And we're talking especially about type ones that you tend to be more insulin resistant in the morning and more insulin sensitive at night. So what that means is, especially if you're doing cardio, you might be battling high blood sugars in the morning with exercise and having trouble with lows in the, the evening. 
Um, so usually it's kind of hard to adjust when you exercise, if you're a morning person or afternoon person. So it's not that you have to switch because one is better than the other. It's just that if you can, try to be consistent with the time of day you exercise because that can make a, such a big difference. Yeah, that's hard though. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You and I have said we don't like exercising in the morning. But there's no question that if I can force myself to get on Peloton in the morning, it almost doesn't matter what my blood sugar is, I don't get low. Mm -hmm. And you're right, you are resistant at that time. And you know, before you eat, before you bolus, maybe a cup of coffee, but it's a good time. And you know, and, and being consistent is always good too, because yeah. your body goes through circadian rhythms. And you do that same Peloton, 6 a.m. versus 6 p.m., well, then you're going to be crashing and going low because you might have insulin on board, but you're just more insulin sensitive. So doing the same thing and all the same prep yeah, yeah. Um, makes big differences What if it's morning or night. So keep that in mind. The other thing that just kind of practical tip, people will ask, well, sometimes I go to the gym and I do um, weights and I do cardio. Is there a good order to do that in? And that's actually been studied, and it's been shown that if you can do your weights or your resistance training, it doesn't have to be with weights, you know, whatever, um, before your cardio exercise, that can actually help prevent you from going low. So if you can choose the order, usually kind of resistance training followed by cardio yeah, is, is a good. I'm going to guess the reason for that, and I don't really know the exact reason, that when you're lifting weights, you got a little more adrenaline and anti-insulin hormones that come out, and then they can help you counteract excess insulin when you exercise, is that right? Uh, good a guess as any. I went to the three P school of uh, <laughs> engineering. Uh. All right, so just keeping those in mind first. And then when it comes to actually ex or the exercising, what to do with your insulin, the name of the game is really kind of getting the insulin on board down. So you don't want to go into a cardiovascular exercise with a whole bunch of insulin on board because you're going to go low. So you need to plan ahead and if you're on one of these hybrid closed loop systems, you can put it in activity mode, exercise mode. But the key there, so first of all, what those do is they aim for a slightly higher blood sugar, 140, 160 in that range. Um, if you're gonna activate that, you wanna do that an hour, if not more, At before least. you exercise. Because if you turn it on right when you start exercising, it's, it's, you might as well not do it, it's too late. Yeah, well, let me say one little uh, fact that it might be too much information. So. Jeremy and I both have hybrid closed loop systems. I go for these long bike rides on the weekend and I might wake up perfectly at 120 and I set my uh, activity mode. It shoots for a blood sugar of 160 to 170. And if my blood sugar creeps up because I've had coffee with milk or I took a small snack and if it goes above that goal, your hybrid closed loop system will give you some insulin. It doesn't know you're about to jump on a bike and ride for 35 miles. And that little bit of bolus mm -hmm. can cause you to get low. So you've got to keep an eye on that thing. A couple times what I do is if I see my system giving me basal insulin before I even start, uh, I'll suspend the insulin. Mm -hmm. And that's an unusual situation. And then I put on the timer and it come, I go check after about 35 minutes. And if I'm in the range, I'll turn it back on. So that might be too much information for some of you, but the, having a uh, closed loop system can create issues Yeah. Even with exercise, even though if you were just standing around doing nothing, it would be perfect. Yeah. So the other thing I've heard people do is sometimes they'll, they'll keep like the tandem in sleep mode all day long because it actually doesn't give the little like correction boluses yeah. as a way to try to avoid that. But I actually am a fan of like those little suspensions, you know, and the good thing about suspending your pump um, is that it'll constantly kind of beep at you to remind you to turn it back on. Right. Versus exercise mode, it generally won't. So yeah. sometimes you can go all day with it in exercise mode and not know it. But if you are going to do a suspension, you know, 30 minutes, an hour before to kind of like zero out the insulin that you have on board um, is, is the way to go. And we should say folks wearing uh, the Tandem Control IQ, which is excellent hybrid closed loop system, you could have a secondary profile that yeah. not only shoots for a different, a higher goal, but reduces the percent of insulin you get when it calculates and you're gonna get some. Right. So, yeah. Now, in a lot of cases, especially with more intense exercise like Peloton, et cetera, I've also found that exercise mode isn't quite enough. Oh. It's not as aggressive. So that's where the suspensions come into play. And then point two that you can do is just try to go on an, into exercise a little bit higher. Um, so again, 180 or so. So, and that, I think that was the technique that you were trying to do of if you're eating before you exercise, intentionally under bolusing a little bit yep. um, so that you kind of go high and then you can exercise that down. I like that because I feel like 
I'm using less insulin for that meal. And then instead of just having, you know, the insulin, you know, absorb all the glucose, I'm actually burning it off. So that kind of that combination for me of going into the exercise a little bit high and reducing my insulin is usually what I do. Yeah. Well, for me, I don't like to eat before. And once again, I've gotten myself in trouble going way above my even my higher level. Okay. And so, um, and I don't like to eat before anyway. I just think if you eat before and you have to figure out how much insulin you need, even though you're giving less, it's kind of a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I was going to tell you is one of my favorite quotes. If you're in a regular exercise mode on the tandem control IQ mm -hmm. and you do not get low, you're not exercising enough. Because mm -hmm. that, that is good for walking, your dog, but um, that's why they have secondary uh, you know, settings. So, so you're just saying it's not as aggressive as it needs to be or doesn't, doesn't take care of everything. That's right. That's yeah. right. And I think that's probably one of the biggest, uh, I wouldn't say complaints, but feedback I get from my patients on the Control IQ, and I have a lot of them, mm -hmm. uh, is that they get low during exercise. Yeah. And then a lot of them have to do the suspend, but um, they don't know how to set a secondary settings, which is quite easy to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I should say the Omnipod 5 has similar settings for exercise. And that was another thing for prep. I have, in general, I don't like it when, I don't advise patients to take off their pumps um, because I think you can get into problems if you don't put it back, et cetera. This comes up a lot though when people that do water sports, um, you know, they're swimmers, you know, what do I do if I'm on the tandem, et cetera. That might be a case that you would actually recommend the Omnipod for somebody if they're in the water a lot, um, just able to keep their pump on. Because if you're on a, a tube pump and have to take it off for an hour or more, that can you can get into problems there. And, and it works, and even if you don't know how to swim, the Omnipod will work fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've done all your prep um, as much as you can. You're trying to get your insulin on board down. You got the time of day kind of squared. You know what exercise you're doing. Let's talk about MDI, folks. Okay, so what's MDI? Multiple daily injections. So, you know, if we go by the statistics in the United States, more than half of you type ones watching are on multiple daily injections. So we've been recommending to J.O. Traceba, great long acting basils. But the, the, I would say the, the downside would be these are not meant to decrease the day before because it takes three or four days to reach a right. cooperation. So you can't just say, I'm gonna take less basil last night for exercise today. Like, yeah. It's just not gonna help. They, people, people, athletic folks did it with Dedemir twice a day, but that it's a little special group. Uh, they were on top of it, and Dedemir doesn't even last 24 hours, so they were able to manipulate that. But I think for most of you on, uh, let's say, Lantis, or uh, hopefully to J.O. Traceba, you can't just do that. So the suggestion would be a little bit what you said, uh, to take a little bit less insulin if you're gonna eat, whether it's within three or four hours of exercise, and the other thing is, uh, I know a lot of you folks just have to eat yourself up a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and have a you know kind bar. Try to eat something healthy that has protein and fat that hangs around for a while. It just doesn't shoot you up, and then you yeah. can exercise that down. And that is a major advantage of pumps in general is you can fine tune these, these things a little bit. So if you're exercising a lot, not on a pump, it's you know something to think about. So. When you're actually doing the exercise, the participation part, this is my second P of Jeremy P's three P system. Um, <laughs> is that yeah, the fourth P is when you haven't gone to the bathroom during no, a four hour bike is, ride. This is my system, you can't just add P's. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so during the participation, one, you know, again, this is a technology talk, have a continuous glucose monitor, have it with you, like look at your blood sugars. And the more that you can be proactive, the better. If you notice that your blood sugar is starting to dip at all, you know, having something with you that you can um, consume carb wise while you're exercising, like glucose tabs, forget about it. The last thing I want is a chalky something in my mouth some, when I'm having a hard time some breathing. Some like them. I mean, if you have, if you like them, God bless them, but I've never seen you eat. You know, I can't glucose stand. tabs, but like <laughs> whether it's the glue, you had those little shock block I love gummies, those. those are so great. And kind of a rule of thumb that sometimes people, like depending on how intense you're exercising, yeah. you might need 15 grams of carbs every 30 minutes or so to kind of maintain your blood sugars, really case by case, but having something with you. Yeah, well, you know what, this whole thing about fueling, um, for, for me, if my blood sugar is not dropping, I don't need to fuel. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, one of these mega athletes that have to fuel no matter what. Yeah. So it, it's it's also an individual thing as yeah. well. And, um, you know, if you're dropping during exercise, you got too much insulin on board, and that should not be a regular thing. But these goo packets, um, they're 100 calories. They taste great. 
all different flavors. You know, Espresso Love is my favorite, but it ra- for some reason, it raises my blood sugar up, but not too high. Yeah. And uh, so it's always important to have that. And the other thing too, as you mentioned, uh, you, you know, you gotta be looking at your numbers. Now you have an Apple Watch, mm-hmm. and uh, it's so convenient to look, when, no totally. matter what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, this is probably why I use uh, my little Dexcom uh, monitor. This is because T refuses to get up, get rid of this watch. She no, thinks it's really cool. My next watch is, uh, I'm waiting for a gift. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the shirt was like five years ago, buddy. Um, but I have a thing on my bike. It's called a bento box, and it sits right there. So I can pull it out, push the button, and see the number. I don't have to put in a code for my phone. Um, and it just, I can just pull it out, look, and put it right back. Yeah, same thing with my watch. I you, love that. That's you, so helpful. You got to look. You gave up your family heirloom watch, I yeah, noticed. Yeah, I had a family Rolex that I, in a safe now because I like to wear this. It was a tough decision. You'll get there. It wasn't worth that much for a safe, but uh-huh. I'm glad you put it there. <laughs> um, you know what? Um, it's the key. It's the key to life with type 1. Look at your blood sugars a lot, no matter what you're doing. All right. Other tips. Um, Keeping glucagon on hand, especially if you're going on a bike ride, you're going to be far away from somewhere, having it in one of your little boxes. Um, There's all kinds of options now that are stable at kind of room temperature. The G pen we've talked about a lot, Baxemi. Having that accessible, having, you know, somebody who's exercising with you know where it is. This is really important for people, especially doing like marathons and things like that. Um, But if you're at home, knowing where it is, or if you go to the gym, having it in the car, just always having it around is a good idea in general, but especially when you're exercising. You know, a lot of people forget that these new glucagon emergency kits are easy to use. You don't have to mix them and do that crazy, you know, chemistry experiment. But a lot of people don't realize that... um, when you're exercising and when there's insulin, you could be dropping quickly. Yeah. You may not be able to consume enough and have it absorbed to prevent your blood sugars from going down where you have a seizure. So it's accessible to give yourself glucagon. Mm-hmm. And uh, the and other it, thing we started talking about, sorry, that's right, is um, so we're talking about like rescue glucagon for seizures and really bad lows or you know a pending bad low. They've been working on and doing a lot of research on mini dose glucagon of giving, you know, getting a glucagon pen and having a small dose of glucagon that you can give before exercise. And that's actually been shown in the research settings to be really um, helpful in preventing lows. So it's not available yet, but gosh, wouldn't it be nice to have a little glucagon pen that instead of stuffing your face with goo, literally goo, you could just give yourself, <laughs> yeah. you know, like a little glucagon? Goo, the, yeah. four, the fifth P. <laughs> yeah. um, you know what? Um, this is an off label comment. Uh, or use, but uh, the folks at Xerus make the Gvoke HypoPen, kind of like an EpiPen. Mm-hmm. It gives it to you all. Then they have the uh, Hypo Syringe. Pre filled syringe. Yeah. yeah, then you can give yourself part of that. Then they actually sell a vial of glucagon and syringe. Hmm. And you can drop what you want and you can get a prescription for that. And you know, you're know you on your own out there because it's never been studied, there's no official use for it. But um, we, we highlighted uh, this research uh, publication in our TCOID Newsy News recently. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen it, it's good about uh, some advanced in the knowledge about mini-dose glucagon from Xerus. All right, so we talked a lot about avoiding lows during exercise. For me, when I'm getting to the last you know, half of my exercise, I kind of start planning for the post meal or the post exercise recovery. And what we're going to talk about is the big deal there is that you can get a spike in your blood sugars. Um, and maybe we should talk about why real quick. So when you yep. are exercising, especially with high intensity cardiovascular exercise, you're mobilizing a lot of glucose, your liver's putting out glucose, you have your adrenaline going, all these hormones that are built to raise your blood sugar to give your body fuel so you can exercise. And the issue is then when you stop exercise, well, your muscles stop uptaking all that glucose, and so it just hangs around in the bloodstream. This becomes even more problematic if you've like dramatically reduced your insulin. Um, so it's a real setup. You have all these hormones raising your blood sugar and little or no insulin, and it's just, like I said, the perfect storm for raising your blood sugar. Yeah, and when I, it reminds me of when I was in Rwanda with Phil Sutherland and the Team Type 1 folks the team that he runs for Novo Nordisk, all with type one riders. You know, I was in the support van and when they stop riding, you know, they've been riding for five hours. Man, their their blood sugars just 
shot through the roof. That's kind of the ultimate example. But think about it. If, if Even if I go on a nice mellow ride with my good friend Bill Polonsky, uh, Jeremy used to go with us uh, before he got married and kids. <laughs> a long, that's a long time ago. Um, you know, you, I'm using less insulin for three to four hours. Yeah. And I shoot up. Not as much as those, those extreme athletes, but you're gonna, we're going to give a tip about the cool down period. Yeah. Most people don't know that. So first of all, like I said, when I'm on the second half of my exercise, and I use Peloton, like let's say I'm doing a 45-minute ride. After 30 minutes, I'll stop the exercise mode. Um, put it back in regular mode, and I might even give myself a little bit of a bolus, depending on where my blood sugars are, yeah. just to start kind of getting the insulin back on board, um, which then brings us officially to our third P, which is the post-exercise recovery. So you got the prep, the participation, and now we're, we're cooling down. And cooling down is actually the best way to avoid a high. So what that means is, after you're doing a high-intensity exercise, I think running is the best uh, example, you're running, you know, three, four, five miles, whatever it is. If you can walk the, le the last 10, 15 minutes of your um, run, that just kind of cool down helps dramatically to kind of have a smooth entry back into the real world where you're still mobilizing glucose, but you're allowing those hormones, adrenaline to kind of calm down. If you're on a cycle, that means 10 minutes of just kind of like slow, um, you know, pedaling. It's tough because everybody wants to get off on their, their day usually, but if you have a post-meal spike problem, that is number one, the most effective way to kind of combat that. Yeah, and when I go riding, uh, it, I have this one hill we go up, which is about 15 minutes before we finish, where we eat, mm -hmm. you know, destination rides, which is, uh, you know, Copa Vida, you know, where you get our, our breakfast and coffee. And if I don't turn, if I don't turn it, all the exercise settings off then, and then I actually sometimes give a bolus there too because they deliver food pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, I could shoot up. So it's, you know, it, when I think about our presentation today, it's like you have to be cognizant of timing. Yeah. Timing is everything. That's why I got like 12 kids. You know? Well, and, and like <laughs> honestly, before, like even when I was a fellow, still doing my endocrinology, <laughs> so, I got that joke to make, they hit late. Um, <laughs> When I was training to be a diabetes specialist, I didn't. I would run, and I never knew why my blood sugars would spike afterwards. It just was like this weird phenomenon to me. So at least understanding why and that this is a common pattern and kind of preparing for it um, can help. So okay, let's say you've dealt with the post meal spike. The last thing you need to know about your post exercise is depending on how long you exercise, how often you exercise, etc. You can be much more insulin sensitive for up to 24 hours later. This really becomes an issue overnight, is let's say you exercise in the evening, you might be more insulin sensitive that night and, and lows is a problem that night, especially for your people on shots. The pumps can help by giving you less insulin automatically, but just knowing that you um, potentially anticipate lows at night. Does that happen to you? It doesn't now because I think, you know, I've gotten a little bit more of my routine and I'm on the system that kind of Blood will help, yeah. but definitely when I was on basal insulin for sure. Yeah, yeah, I would say, Thanks to these hybrid closed loop systems, it, it does, doesn't protect you 100%, but it helps because as it sees your blood sugars to drop, it reduces insulin delivery and even stops it. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a crapshoot out there, folks. <laughs> so we're going to move to Q&A, but any kind of closing comments? I mean, remember the 3P system. It's, it's foolproof. It was designed um, March 14th, 2023, um, but I like it. Um, what's the second P? Um, it's preparation, participation. And, and post. post, yeah. I will never forget those three Ps. Okay. Uh, no, I would just say, I think we said it all, hopefully clearly. You can always uh, watch our video, which we go into all these different areas, the exercise challenge, and uh, feel free to send questions to our website. So great, a couple of these questions were, you know, hopefully what we just answered. How do you, how do you deal with rebound highs? What do you recommend? Um, to avoid acute rise in blood sugars. And I think anything else to kind of highlight on that? I think we talked about mostly, I think honestly preparing for your post exercise period is so important. I do like bolusing at the end of my exercise and the cool down is so, so um, helpful. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing that most people don't know about for the sake of repeating briefly is about 20 to 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes before you finish your exercise, mm -hmm. you should turn off your exercise settings where yeah. it's shooting for a higher level. And if you're on a lower basal rate, turn it back up to normal. And if you're gonna be eating as soon as you stop, uh, then think about a little mini bolus. And once again, it's trial and error.
And that was a question, when should you resume activity mode or resume normal mode after exercise? And I think our, our points are both actually do it during, at the, when you're kind of wrapping up your exercise. Yeah. All right, I, this is a person, not Jeremy, but I also am excited. So I'm excited to get the Dexcom G7, we are also. Will there be features that make it easier to monitor my exercise? Well, <laughs> I would say no. Uh, but I'd say the, the thing that's important to monitor your exercise is really the hybrid closed loop that you're using. Mm -hmm. But the G7 is awesome. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a much better form factor. Have you worn it yet? I have not worn it yet. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that are looping, uh, like Jeremy and I, it's all set up for the G7. You put yours in yet? I haven't. I'm just waiting for this one to fall off, which it looks like it's in yeah, a second now. Yeah, getting rid of a G6 is sacrilegious just for the sake of starting a G7 earlier. Now, for those of you on the Tandem Control IQ and the Omnipod 5, I know you're, I know you're dying to know. Uh, I, we, we have been grilling the folks at Tandem and at Insulet, and they say they're working on it. And believe it or not, because they cannot really start working on it until it's approved, um, they're they can't have it available now. Yeah. But they, they know it, it's needed and they have to do software updates and they have to get it approved by the FDA. And that's why looping is a little bit different because folks on looping, they don't have to go to the FDA. All right, what is the best glucagon to have on hand that doesn't require the whole outdated assembly kit? So the two that we are using the most now are the Gvoke HypoPen which is like an EpiPen. Um, you don't have to mix it. You don't have to shake it or anything. It's in a, in a pen. You don't see the needle. You just push it down. Um, you can even do it through the clothes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it automatically injects the glucagon, and it's the full dose. So it's a you know a like a recovery dose. One milligram for adults. Yeah. yeah. And it has a shelf life of two years. Um, so and you can keep it in your you know whatever. And the other is Baximi, which is a nasal. It's B A Q. It's IMI, something like that. It's yeah. a nasal one, also stable for two years. You just inject it into your nose. Yeah. And by the way, either of these you can use on yourself. They're typically reserved for like severe hypos. Or like if Steve was having a seizure, I would use it on him. But if you're exercising and you can't drink something or eat something for any reason, for God's sakes, use your glucagon. I laugh because you always give the example is me having a seizure. Yeah. I could use it on him if he's having a seizure. <laughs> um, and I think that's... And then we talked a little bit about mini dose uh, glucagon, which is coming. Mm -hmm. But um, I've used it on myself several times. Yeah. Uh, and you, I know you have uh, the uh, old one. Yeah, which has like a needle that's like this thick. It's yeah. hard to actually inject it. For those of you that don't have one of the newer formulations, you should really uh, talk to your caregiver, your doctor, and find out one which one is covered by your insurance company because some have preferences depending on contracting with the company. It's right. complicated. <laughs> what are the best forms of exercise for newly diagnosed? Steve's blood sugar is going up because he's preparing for exercise. You're right. The, you're right. The first P. Um, what are the best exercises for newly diagnosed? So there's, um, you know, newly diagnosed type one, type two. There's no best form, but I would just pick something um, kind of easier to start with, so you can see the effects on your blood sugar. Maybe first starting with walking, and as you get more comfortable with, you know, the effects on your blood sugar, you can do whatever you really want. Well, they're new to type one, but they're not new to exercise. Or new to type two, it doesn't say, but. Um, yeah, you, sorry to interrupt you. No, I just mean like there's no, just do what you're comfortable with. Yeah, and uh, if, you know, if you're someone that loves to exercise, don't let diabetes get in your way. Get a CGM, and, and that's the key. And if you're a type 2, get out there and exercise. If, if you're a type 2 not on insulin or sulfonylureas, you can do anything you want. You can run a marathon. Uh, if you're on insulin, you have to be a little bit more careful than you are if you're on those oral medications yeah. that can cause you to get low. Let me do a couple of these quickly. Is there a yeah. certain blood sugar level at which a person should consume carbs before exercising to avoid lows? Not necessarily. I mean, you can get to a place, place where you can just adjust your insulin levels, and there might be Peloton rides that you and I have done that we never have to consume any calories, especially in the morning. So it depends on a lot of the factors yeah. that we discuss, but there's but, no number, I would say. But the other important thing that people forget, look at the frickin' trend arrow. Yeah. That tells you if you're going up, you're stable, or going down. And that makes a huge difference of when to consume carbs. All right. Is it better to avoid intensive exercise so that blood sugar levels don't go up radically while exercising? So I would say no. I mean, we <laughs> want people to do whatever kind of exercise they like doing because it's so good for them. And 
we know plenty of type 1s. There was this guy, Eric Tozer, we've had speak at TCYD. person with type 1 diabetes, he did seven marathons in seven days on seven different continents. Yep. Started in Antarctica, did a marathon. Flew to South America, did a marathon the next day. So, obviously we're not all doing that, but it just goes to show, you can do whatever you want, and it shouldn't be the other way around. But this person shouldn't. wants to say no. Yeah. Don't ever do intensive exercise. Yeah. You can tell your, no, that's your, what you wanted. You can tell your significant other, I can't take out the garbage because <laughs> yeah. it really gets my blood sugar yeah, gone. You know what? Uh, don't let it get in the way, and you might have to do baby steps and experiment with a technique that keeps you in the range. Um, okay, will glucagon ever not work because you backpacked for four days and multiple lows and used up glycogen stores? So... Uh, no. So glucagon really should always work. So there's a, the idea here is that you can use up all your glucose in the liver. Um, but you, if you're generally, if you're as long as you're still eating something during these periods, you should have some glycogen stores. And it can also cause what we call gluconeogenesis or new production of glucose. Yeah. So I always tell people if you need it, for God's sakes, use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Same with that. That theory goes out with people drinking alcohol. Yeah. Will glucagon work? It still works. Still take it and be prepared to call paramedics or someone else if for some reason you're not coming out of it. Um, can you recommend any exercise that help your low BMI type 2 patients, especially those not on insulin? I aim to reduce visceral fat to see if it improves my insulin resistance. What's that? Walking. Yeah. Well, so really there's no like special exercise either for, for people with diabetes. So if you're trying to lose weight, type 1 or type 2, it still comes down to calories in and calories out. So that typically means a combination of reducing the amount of calories you're eating through any kind of diet, whether it's intermittent fasting or low carb or whatever it is, and increasing your activity. And actually, the other thing I was going to say is that this is where actually having type 1 can be kind of nice because I actually kind of actively monitor my, my total daily dose of insulin. And I like to see when I'm eating lower carb or, ins or exercising more to actually see that come down. Yeah. And that does actually tend to track pretty well with, with weight. Yeah, I, I think if there was an exercise person here, he'd say, do the exercise that you enjoy doing so you continue doing. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, type 2s do have that abdominal obesity, and that's hard to lose mm -hmm. with exercise. That's, that's like stuck there, unfortunately. You can get in much better shape, lose subcutaneous fat, and that's all really good. But I wouldn't drive yourself crazy trying to get rid of the what we call the in, increased abdominal fat. That's a certain type of fat associated with type 2 that's way in the abdomen area. Yeah. All right, maybe this will be our last one. So do you recommend a tiny bolus when disconnected and in the water for more than an hour? My blood glucose stayed perfect for an hour and a half after being disconnected, but then it started to raise. Maybe I need a small bolus at that point to fend off a high. So first of all, water sports are tough. Surfers, you know, swimmers, things like that. Um, generally, if you're disconnecting for more than an hour, you, you definitely can run into issues with these, these post-exercise highs. So you can try a little you know, bolus when you first disconnect. Um, and then take it off to see if that helps. I mean, sometimes, to be honest, when I was using the tandem, I would just do a little bolus like before I got in the shower, um, just like, you know, to kind of make up for, to kind of ride out the disconnect. All trial and it error. It takes our shower, water <laughs> shortage. You know what, the other thing is, uh, one of my few inventions in life is the untethered regimen, uh, meant yeah. to be for a type one who was a scuba diver. He loved being on a pump, but he, he disconnected a lot. So he took 75% of his basal through his pump, and then every night he took a little bit of long-acting insulin. So he could go on and off the pump and still have some insulin on board. Yeah. You can read about it in the... And I've done that when I've you know, gone like on tropical vacations in the water, you know, having some background basal all the time. So if you disconnect your pump for a long time, um, you don't go sky high. So that yeah. actually is a super cool method. All right, so we're closing up. So we wanted to mention a couple cool things coming up at TCYD. First yes. is our virtual conference in April, which is, which day? April 15th. Which is a Saturday. So um, make sure to register. You can register for free. If you can't sit down that Saturday to watch, please just register anyways because um, you'll be able to watch um, online for a period of time. And the other thing is our TCYD one conference, which is our first in-person conference for people with type 1 diabetes. It's more of a retreat, actually, from Friday to Sunday in August. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's at the Paradise Point here in San Diego. So cool to have six, 700 type 1s take over this resort with all cool lectures and just fun activities. Yeah, most of, most of our really good speakers have type 1 themselves. And you know what? It, it, it always We always get blown away. Adults with type 1 need to hang out with each other. Yeah. 
I mean, like you and me, it's just not just it's not just for kids, you know. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed watching this. Make sure to go on to TCOID.org, see everything else is coming up. Also, we have, you know, podcasts for you guys to check out. If you haven't done that, those have been a lot of fun. Yes. Um, Sex and diabetes was my favorite. <laughs> oh, no, alcohol was yeah. my favorite. <laughs> All right. Take care.